now our monthly session of Ask the Premier. Premier Brad Wall joins us. Uh, the Premier checks in uh, once a month, and uh, whether we have him in studio, sometimes we catch him on the road, other times uh, at his home base in Swift Current, his office at the legislature. It is an opportunity for you as a Saskatchewan citizen to get an update from the Premier. Different stories affecting all of us, different things you've been asking questions about, and we take it to the phones. So, Lines are already lighting up, and this happens often with the Premier, so uh, get your questions ready at 1-877-332-8255. Or, if you want to pass your questions along, texting at 306-306, on Twitter, at John Gormley Live, or any other way you want to ask those questions, get them in, and I will ask them to the Premier for you. Uh, Premier Brad Wall joining us in Swift Current this morning. Mr. Premier, uh, thanks for taking our call, and welcome back. Thanks, John. Plus, on the show, apparently, uh, a lot of bumpers from rock, the Rock of Ages soundtrack. Lots of eight seconds worth of 80s music. <laughs> That's very Pretty true. Good. Good. Uh, highly recommended, by the way, on my last riff. I, I, I caught the end of the uh, last hour, so you've seen that show. I have. I, I thought it was great. And I know you're a guitar guy um, from way back. And uh, it might bring back some memories. I bet it will. Although Tom Cruise singing, I'm not sure we'll do yeah. it, but it's, it's all good. <laughs> I um, want to ask you, Premier, um, I don't think we've chatted since uh, the spring session of the Ledge came to an end. Um, the business, at least in the Legislative Assembly, uh, is not ongoing, but of course the business of government is. Uh, a number of stories uh, that, of course, post that session. Um, clearly, the, the issue that got a lot of play was this Saskatchewan uh, Employment Film Tax Credit. Uh, the government wound it up in the budget. You were responding to a lot of questions. Where does that sit now in terms of where we go ahead or forward? Well, we did what we said we would do. We, uh, we did meet with the film industry. We provided an extension for them, the one they requested, until the, uh, till the end of June. Uh, and then we started to, uh, to discuss the potential of some replacement. You remember all along that our, our challenge, our, our problem with the film tax credit, the way it exists, is that it's not really a tax credit. It's a grant. And 98% of the circumstances where the program's accessed, it's paid out as a grant to companies, whether they make any money in the province or whether they're from here. Uh, and uh, we wanted to see a, a program, a change, such that it would actually be a tax credit. So if companies made a profit in the province, they could get a significant tax credit or reduction in the taxes paid on profits made or income made in, I should say, income made in Saskatchewan. Uh, and um, that was the offer, but the industry has, uh, you know, said, no, we, we need the grant program. That's what happens in about 40 states in the U.S. and other provinces in the country, and we need to compete. And, and I guess that's just where we agree to disagree, John, because we're, we're saying, actually, we want to get out of the bidding war. We, in this budget, set a number of priorities uh, it to, uh, to do a better job on highways, to do a better job in health care, for example, to expand colorectal screening, to uh, invest in a number of important capital projects in education and and to balance the budget, and, and because those were our priorities, we were moving away from grants to a specific kind of a, a sector, and, and this, is, uh, this is one of those. So uh, that's where we're at today. Uh, the, the, the tax credit extension ends at, at, with the end of June, and uh, we're not going to be replacing it with a grant. We're going to get out of the bidding war uh, for, for the industry that other provinces are in, um, simply because we've signaled that we want to set other priorities. And we also want to keep... Taxes generally low for the entire economy. We, well, our economic policies should be, we think, as broad-based as possible and not necessarily sector-specific and certainly not informed by a grant for one particular company. Premier Brad Wall with us. The other issue on resource development. Uh, obviously, uh, we look at potash, we look at the huge role being played, but oil, natural gas, and particularly the continued development of oil in the Bakken play, the other play now moving over toward uh, your neighborhood in southwestern Saskatchewan, price of oil has been down significantly, uh, 84 $85 a barrel, and not 100 What does that do looking at provincial revenue projections? Well, it has an impact. If the, uh, if the price were to stay below our target, and our target in the budget, based on what forecasters were saying at the time, it's about $100 a barrel. So uh, for every dollar it remains on it, if it, were, if it were to remain a dollar, for each dollar below that target that it remains, John, uh, for the entire budget year. So it would have to average out for the whole year, I guess is my point. My, the, the point I'm clumsily trying to make, it's about 18 to $20 million in, in terms of provincial revenue. So it's potentially significant. Now, typically, though, what happens when the dollar comes or when the oil, when the price of oil comes off a little bit? So does the 
so does the currency, so does, so does the Canadian dollar, and actually that helps our budgeting to the tune of about $25 million or so per penny, again, if it was averaged out over the whole year. So there's a bit of a balance because the dollars come off, but certainly not as much as oil has. So, you know, I've asked the finance minister to have a contingency plan ready. Uh, if it looks like this is going to be a lasting number, this new price of oil we're at, we need to have a contingency plan to make sure that uh, that fiscal responsibility remains the hallmark of the budget that we've introduced and passed, that the balance, uh, that the budget is balanced. Uh, so, uh, you know, he's going to be presenting that, uh, different options for uh, uh, for that contingency if we see the the price of oil not uh, not recovering or staying at about the level it's at now. Premier Brad Wall with us. This is Ask the Premier. We will chat in this first segment, and then we go to the phones, and the lines are lighting up, lighting up already. It's 1-877-332-8255. Uh, it's been observed, and certainly uh, the last time you checked in with us, you were at a Western Premier's meeting at Edmonton, uh, that just given the ebb and flow and the, the life cycle of politics, uh, you are now the elder among the Western Premiers. Scary, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> and so that, with that in mind, though, you've also taken the position, and some have noted uh, perhaps earlier and more vigorously than Alison Redford has, uh, re-Thomas Mulcair in the oil sands, uh, re-certain other positions on natural resource policy. Are we in a position now where Western Canada is feeling more threatened with respect to resources? Well, in the country today, we have a, the official opposition federally, and a party that, if the polls are right and an election were held today, could conceivably form the national government, have said pretty clearly, this is the NDP, supported, by the way, by the provincial NDP here, strangely enough, have said that when it comes to the resource sector, not just the oil sands, but the, the, the natural resource sector of the country, that they want to see the environmental cost for that industry internalized. That is code for, well, effectively a carbon tax or cap and trade which is, as we've discussed in the past, is not about environmental policy. It's actually about a wealth transfer. In this case, it would come from the West and would go to other parts of the country. Uh, if, if we had a chance, John, to travel back in time to the, uh, to the age of the NEP, the National Energy Program, if we had a chance to do that, to get ahead of the introduction of that program and to do whatever we could to make sure it was never visited on Western Canada, on Saskatchewan and on Alberta, this massive wealth transfer that happened that cost thousands of jobs in the West, I think we would do that. Well, we're seeing glimpses of NEP-like policies again from the NDP, and I think it's important that we stand up now, very proactively now, uh, and call a spade a spade in this regard, make sure the people of the country understand that the, the, uh, the impacts of these kinds of policies, not just in the West, but across the country, because right now Western Canada is providing significant economic strength, not just for our region, but for the country at a time when nations around the world would be envious of this kind of economic uh, opportunity. So I think we need to be vigilant, and we're going to continue to do that from Saskatchewan's perspective. Premier Brad Wall with us. All right, uh, this morning, reality check, 55% of our respondents in answer to the questions, should Saskatchewan move to mandatory bicycle helmet laws? This, is, of course, is being urged by uh, the chief coroner in Ontario. What are your thoughts on making bike helmet laws a provincial mandatory policy? You know, we hope people use the bike helmet, certainly, and, and the STI has a very uh, significant, expansive, and comprehensive education program uh, that's available so that people know all of the facts and the importance of, of helmets. Uh, there isn't a plan right now for any provincial mandates. Um, I, municipalities have that option, uh, but there are no plans provincially to do it, although obviously it's, it's a very important uh, thing for people to remember, for families, for adults as well, that helmets help, and the people should be using them. Mr. Premier, hang on. Premier Brad Wall is here. Now, we have questions from needle exchange programs to highways to issues about the way Saskatchewan and the West plays a role in Canada vis-a-vis -vis Quebec. A lot of interesting questions coming up, and this is where you get a chance to put your question on Ask the Premier to Brad Wall. Stand by. It's 1-877-332-8255. I'm John Gormley, and this is News Talk Radio. I'm 
John Gormley, Premier Brad Wall. We call this Ask the Premier, uh, whether he is uh, in our studios, on the phone, joining us uh, from around the province. Uh, it's a regular monthly update with the Premier and you. Uh, Premier Wall, as we get to the calls, uh, usually we use uh, this for some unfinished business. Uh, questions listeners had last month, uh, some follow-ups. Sure, John, thanks. I'll try to go through these quickly so we have time for more calls. Uh, had a call last time on... Uh, on Highway 5 between Bruno and Saskatoon. The question was, what about adding shoulders? This is a, this is a possibility. Uh, you're going to be hearing more, and your listeners will be hearing more, hearing more John, about our plan to uh, in significantly increase passing lanes in the province. There's also some twinning work that's going to continue to be needed, and I know we've got a call coming up on that on, on 16. Uh, if, we, if number five is to be a candidate for passing lanes, obviously we have to do some work on the shoulders. That's not the case now currently in the five-year plan. But as you know, we're having another look at that five-year plan to make sure that, uh, that uh, it's uh, certainly informed by, by the engineers, by safety, by the traffic count numbers that are essential, but also... Uh, you know, just by some common sense, depending on some developments that might be happening on either end of any particular highway. So that's uh, the, the shoulders are a possibility there if it's part of that twinning process. We had another call from Melford, if you remember, who said that SaskTel was told they couldn't transfer the land phone number to a private company. And we did double check. I, I think I remember mentioning on the, on the, uh, during, the, during the hour that that didn't seem right because Tel is pretty good about about these kinds of switches, and they are. It turns out that uh, we contacted the individual, and it was actually the company was switching to, uh, was not providing uh, services there, actually. Uh, and so uh, uh, then there was a call, I think, from Darcy, concerned about education taxes, saying they were the highest uh, uh, in the country in terms of his place in Saskatoon. We're right in the middle of the package. You know, John, early on in our, uh, early on in our uh, first term, we moved to reduce the, the education share property tax some will argue there's more work to be done. There is. We've also increased revenue sharing to municipalities to help them hold uh, uh, municipal, the municipal portion of property tax down. So we're right about in the middle of the pack right now. And that takes care of the three from, uh, from last time. All right. Thank you. Premier Brad Wall doing the follow-up uh, from many of your questions uh, last time around. Let's go to Dave in Saskatoon. Dave, uh, highway twinning question. Uh, just uh, wondering about Highway 16. I've been traveling Highway 16 from Saskatoon to Manitoba for the last 25, 30 years. There has been no mention made about any twinning or any possible construction there. we got three to four mines building up on Highway 16. The traffic is atrocious, uh, and there has been many accidents. I'm wondering what is the plan in the future. Well, as I referenced in the uh, just off the top of this last section here, you know, we do... We're going to be unveiling a much more aggressive plan in terms of passing lanes. Um, they're not a complete replacement or the perfect replacement for twitting, but they're a help. Uh, that's a one particular uh, highway that's a, that's a challenge. There's a lot of economic activity, uh, as the caller points out. And, um, you know, we have, uh, we're, we're right in the midst of a, another budget, a highways budget, that ties us for the highest, you know, budgeted amount ever spent in the province because we know there's more work to be done in highways especially not just in new construction but in maintenance so uh, but uh, I think you're going to be hearing more uh, in the very near future on on passing lanes uh, and a new strategy for the, the very busy highways in the province. Premier Brad Wall with us Dallas and East End this is Ask the Premier sir. Yes uh, hello Brad uh, Dallas here uh, I just wanted to ask you if this is or isn't the right time to uh, Maybe start taking a look at equalization as it's, it's really not what it was intended for. Uh, it's kind of a welfare system anymore that's just being abused, and uh, they're not even trying to get themselves out of debt. Mainly I'm talking about Quebec. We won't even talk about Ontario that's driven it into the ditch. But it's, it's, it's kind of hard to take when we're shipping them so much money and they turn around and want to badmouth us. And uh, I realize that it's, it's getting to be a real cultural thing in Quebec, and this is going to be a hard train to turn around, but th this is kind of getting out of hand. And I also will put a caveat on it that it wasn't long ago that we were in the same boat. But, uh, you know, now that we're kind of free of the shackles, uh, we kind of got to, to put it to these people in a way that all the provinces kind of got to start pulling their weight. I was wondering if we could, if we could start nudging them that way or, or let it be known that's kind of how we feel out here. Well, Dallas asked a very important question, John, in a, in a very generous Saskatchewan way, uh, because it's true we were recipients of uh, equalization. We were a have-not province for many, many years, for most of the time since this fiscal federalism, this new formula of equalization was started decades ago. 
and we're grateful for that fact. Now, we can argue, we can have a debate, I guess, about whether we should or shouldn't have been for as long as we were, but the fact of the matter is we did receive a lot of equalization benefits, and I think Saskatchewan people are grateful. And now that we're contributing, now that we're net contributors, which is over oversimplifying the program, but now that we're a have province, I think people are also happy that we're able to... Uh, um, to be net contributors to the country. Uh, there is a debate coming. Uh, 214 is the year uh, where the equalization program needs to be renewed. And I think there's going to be some of this discussion to be held. Uh, it is true that there are certain jurisdictions that are major benefactors of equalization. Uh, Quebec is the largest benefactor, and I think it's close to $8 billion this year. Uh, the principle of equalization is this, that the program is supposed to allow for provincial governments to offer relatively the same level of public service at relatively the same level of cost or tax base uh, right across the country. It shouldn't matter where you live, in other words. Uh, and that's, that principle is sound, but I think it is fair to ask the question, is that principle what, uh, what is driving the current formula and payout? Because we do see some places, and Quebec's one, for example, that has very generous social programs. Uh, you know, very generous programs in terms of daycare, in terms of tuition, actually. Uh, notwithstanding the protests, I think they're the second lowest in the country, even after the increases uh, that the uh, the government wants to, to uh, impose there. So I think it's reasonable to start asking the question, is it meeting its original intent, the equalization formula, uh, and is it fair to to all the regions? And that's, we can play an active part. I think we can be a good, honest broker there because we are grateful for having been recipients for some time. Uh, we don't plan on going back to that. Uh, and I think what we can offer an interesting perspective. Premier Brad Wall with us. This is our session of Ask the Premier, your opportunity to put your questions to the Premier. Let's go quickly now to uh, Louise. Louise, you're on with Premier Wall. Uh, is it L Lois? It's Lois. Oh, I'm sorry, Lois. Go ahead. Um, I'm calling about the closure of Valley View Health Center at Moose Jaw. We have a brother there, and I'm sure that you know that it was just sprung upon us, like we were given a two-day notice and then it was put on the uh, air that it was going to be closed. And we've had two meetings since, and we actually haven't been told what is going to happen, whether we're getting a new facility built or not going to have a facility, where we're going to be putting our brother, how there's going to be a building built or not. We've been told that there's going to be a new capital investment of $45.4 million. Um, there's 200 residents right now, and it's all up in the air. Lois, hang on. That's a very good question. When we return, uh, we'll get Premier Brad Wall to respond. The uh, uh, Old Valley View Center in Moose Jaw, after many years, the announced closure. Uh, when we get back, Premier Wall will respond to that and more of your questions. And for callers... A number of you regular listeners to this program, the whole issue of harm reduction, needle exchanges, we'll start the next round with that one as well. I'm John Gormley. This is News Talk Radio. I'm John Gormley. Welcome back. This is our monthly session of Ask the Premier. Premier Brad Wall joins us. Uh, whether we find him in transit, uh, somewhere on the roads of this province, uh, at the legislature, at the Premier's office, uh, his uh, home base in Swift Current, we usually find him for an hour, and he takes your calls on any questions you want to put to Saskatchewan's Premier. Uh, Premier Wall, just heading into the bottom of the hour, uh, Lois had asked the question, uh, the closure of the Valley View uh, Special Care Facility, the long-time care in Moose Jaw, uh, what's happening to that centre? Well, we have announced that we're going to be phasing out that particular facility. We've been working with, uh, with uh, well, for one, the, fan the Valley View Family Group and uh, the Saskatchewan Association of Community Living. For some time, they've been counselling governments, uh, including the previous administration, that that particular aged institution was not a standard of care for those who are very vulnerable and who need, uh, who arguably uh, need much better care. The facility's been uh, uh, venerable. It's been uh, it's been there for a long time and, and provided uh, a good service. And uh, and we have made the decision to move towards a, a more community-based model and less of an institutional model. Uh, we are working with the uh, the Valley View Family Group and the Saskatchewan Association of Community Living to develop the options for all the residents, the 200 that uh, that Lois mentioned that are there. No one is going to be moved, John, without a personal plan for each and every person that's there. We're going to take our time, uh, and we're going to get this right. Um, there won't be a replacement institution. That's the point. We want to move away from this particular model, which is maybe right for the 60s, but 
not the modern standard of care we want. We are going to move towards a more community-based uh, approach uh, in a number of centers. Uh, there may also be an option for for some uh, residents to be a part of, of the brand new Saskatchewan hospital in, in the Battlefords. But we won't move anyone before there's a plan. Uh, and, you know, we do have the support for this decision from from the Valley View family group and others in uh, who have long wanted us to, to modernize this uh, the level of care for those who are most vulnerable. And by the way, it builds on what I think is a very aggressive and proper plan for those who have disabilities in this province. Recently, we just uh, kept a campaign promise to increase uh, the level of income that those living independently with disabilities can receive. We moved away from a wealth, the, the social assistance approach in the first term, to something called SED, Saskatchewan Assured Income uh, for the Disabled. And now we're actually adding to that. We're increasing the amount of money for those folks who require that to live independently. And I, this, uh, this Valley View decision is part of that overall plan to try to make this the best province in the country in terms of those who have disabilities or the family members of those who have disabilities. And we've got work to do, but Valley View and the improvement to it is part of that plan. Premier Brad Wall with us. Uh, many questions coming up. Uh, let me go quickly to Twitter. Uh, when will there be a new wine and liquor store in Saskatoon? Uh, after the uh, recent developments in there involving the business that was closed by SLGA. Uh, Premier, uh, what lies ahead there? Well, the uh, the SLGA uh, regularly updates the markets in the province and looks at, look, where can there be a new store, potentially where in what parts of rural Saskatchewan can there be a new vendor, which are current private vendors within the liquor distribution system in the province. And I don't have a specific uh, answer to that um, uh, in terms of the Saskatoon market. We can actually report back and say, look, at, you know, we can offer the SLGA report as to whether or not there's a new store warranted. I don't have the exact information on that, but that's generally how the process works. There's a bit of a market analysis and assessment done, and then SLGA would make a recommendation for a new store or a new vendor uh, in some location. Okay, so uh, let's bring that back next time for a uh, query. Can, can, um, can we also say this for Lois who had phoned? I'm sorry, for Lois had phoned in on Valley View. She obviously has a. She was talking about her brother, yeah. and we'd like to be able to respond to her directly if she wants to call in to the government either to. Uh, uh, to the social services minister or her MLA and reference this discussion on John Gormley Live, we can actually look into her the, the specific case of her brother because we are trying to develop a plan for each of those residents, John. Okay, Lois, make sure you do that. Um, on this other question, um, the road ahead, you know, you're looking on, on the whole uh, wine uh, liquor distribution system. Uh, you've been pushed hard by people like me who would like to see the private sector involved in the retailing of alcohol, wine, and spirits. So uh, you've got these neighborhoods. You know, the other day I'm in Saskatoon in the middle of some new neighborhood. That, you know, I thought it was somewhere in Calgary, right? I got lost in this neighborhood. Miles and miles of, you know, of shopping strips, new condos, new houses. There's no liquor store there, you know, and, and maybe there will be one day. But of course, if it's the Saskatchewan tradition the government will either build a big brick liquor store or they will hire somebody in the private sector and lease their big liquor store. Are you looking at a movement now uh, based on the Willow Park experience and unfortunately the Cava experience to start looking at newer stores being operated um, with the flexibility of the private sector? We have a new minister in place, John Donna Harpower, has taken over SLJ, and I've asked her to, to uh, be open to different options, uh, not just in terms of how we sell liquor, but the licensing process. And I think on, on the odd show, uh, you've also had a discussion about that with certain guests. Yes, we have. I think it's reasonable for us to be looking at uh, the permitting uh, uh, regime in the province of Saskatchewan. I think it's reasonable to look at how uh, liquor is sold in Saskatchewan now. We're going to keep the promise we made in the campaign. We've worked hard to be a government that kept its promises, not only for the things that we said we would do, but also the things that we said we wouldn't do. And we said there's not going to be a wholesale change or selling of stores the government currently has. I think you asked me that pointedly when I was on the show uh, during the election campaign. And we're going to keep, that, uh, keep the promise that we made. Uh, going forward, in terms of new facilities that are required, again, I think we're going to be willing to look at different options and... Uh, um, you know, you, you've mentioned quite rightly that a number of neighborhoods in our major centers are growing and growing fast. We also have rural communities that are growing, which is very positive, but where there might also be a case for increased availability, uh, increased points of sale. And so I think it's fair to say we're, I've asked the minister to look at all the options. This is Ask the Premier. Let's go to Laurie in Saskatoon. Laurie, thank you for hanging on. You're on with Premier Wall. Hello, Mr. Wall. It's, it's a pleasure to speak with you this morning. I would like to ask you a question about harm reduction and the needle exchange program in Saskatchewan. 
since 1996, that's uh, the needle exchange harm reduction started in Saskatchewan. So it's been about 18, almost 20 years. Uh, Saskatchewan has the highest per capita of HIV affected people with HIV. Uh, we uh, exchange more needles than Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg combined. Um, we're supposed to be saving tax dollars, but with all these increase, I guess we have a, a, a HIV epidemic now, I've heard on the news. How are we saving our tax dollars? and Or how is that saving our tax dollars? And do you feel that the needle exchange should be scrapped and, meth and the methadone program uh, have a, a big overhaul done on it? Because that's also being abused. What are your thoughts? Thanks for the call, Lori. We shortly after the election um, of the of I guess in the first term after 2007 uh, we did ask the health ministry and regions to uh, encourage much more frequent contact with with clients uh, to to with a view to reducing the number of needles exchanged we do have a situation where uh, 94 percent of the needles that are provided are returned my understanding is they are returned uh, when uh, new needles are sought, but that doesn't change the fact, of course, that many are discarded. And every spring we hear the stories and see the stories on, on our media about the impact of that. We're going to continue to monitor it very carefully uh, because we do think that it's important to manage these numbers. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we recognize that uh, there's a lot of data out there, and it, it informs our Ministry of Health and the health regions in this. There's a lot of data out there that demonstrates that these kinds of exchanges, when that reduce the uh, the uh, incidence of needles being shared also reduces the incidence of HIV, which are too high in the province. So, um, but we we want the regions and uh, in the centers in our province to be managing these numbers down because they are very high. And um, we've asked for some very specific things from them in this regard, including much greater contact with the people that are using the needles, so that there's an opportunity for for intervention and education. There has been talk, uh, and I remember this from a police officer some time back, or a fairly senior police official, uh, that even if the health regions would use, because they are the, the bulk of the distribution, uh, if they used, for example, a fluorescent you know, plunger on the needle, it would give police and community officials a much better idea as to which needles are in circulation. Has, has the health ministry thought about that, of mandating a needle that's identifiable? So again, if they are found on the streets, if they're found somewhere, we know who's responsible. I don't know the answer to that, and that's something I think I'm going to check into for the next show. Thank you. Premier Brad Wallace here. Callers, stand by. This is our monthly session of Ask the Premier. When we get back, seniors in long-term care, funding for post-secondary institutions like SIAST, elder abuse, and just a few other questions you're asking today. Also, we'll go to the tweets. We'll go to questions on Facebook as well. I'm John Gormley. This is News Talk Radio. I'm John Gormley. Welcome back. This is Ask the Premier. Premier Brad Wall and you at 1-877-332-8255. Okay, where do we go? I want to make sure uh, we've had one caller patiently waiting on the question of post-secondary education and SIAS. So let's go to that caller now. John in Regina, you're on with Premier Wall. Yes, uh, thank you, John, and uh, good morning, Premier Wall. It's an honor and pleasure to speak with you today. I have a question regarding funding uh, for SIAS programming, in particular programs to assist newcomers, immigrants, and sponsorees with their language acquisition and uh, to get them uh, to get their language and cultural abilities uh, up to snuff to integrate into our workplace, our workforce particularly with trades and technologies. So I was just wondering what the province's goal is with respect to assisting uh, internationally educated professionals with integration into our current workforce. Thank you very much. Oops, good question. Well, thanks for the call. Uh, the, as you know, John, we have uh, a three-pronged approach to population growth in the province to help deal with the labor shortage. The first is that we would be uh, fully, and this isn't just about population, this is about the labor shortage, that we would be more fully engaging our First Nations uh, and Métis people in the province whose unemployment rates higher than it is for non-Aboriginals. Secondly, that we would attract other Canadians to our province. And then thirdly, the third prong, and one that's been very successful, I would say, over the last number of years, is to increase the number of immigrants 
immigrants to the uh, province with a view to actually fulfilling some labor shortage needs as well as accommodating new families. We've seen just significant growth between 01 and 05. I think there was about 8,000 immigrants in total, and we'll do 10,000 this year. Along with that, the caller is quite right, isn't it? is a need for the government to support, to increase support for English as a second language, for welcome centers, for settle, what's known as settlement services. And we've done that uh, very significantly in terms of percentage dollars, new money uh, provided for institutions, whether it's a, whether it's a, a, a CBO, a non-government agency, or in the case of education, we've also been working to provide some some funding there because teachers in a large center like Saskatoon or even a place like Swift Current where we have a number of new citizens are now tasked with the uh, with the challenge and the opportunity to help provide education to those who are relatively new to the country and new to the language and the culture. So, uh, you know, again, here's an example where we could always be doing more, but there has been a significant increase in this. We need to continue to uh, to improve because we need to continue to welcome new residents to our province to help us deal with a labor shortage and just add to our population. We know that's good for the economy. An expanded, broadened tax base is what helps fund the quality of life. It helps us keep taxes competitive and uh, and keep this uh, sort of virtuous circle, this growing economy and attracting more people going. So we have to make sure the settlement services are there. Premier Brad Wall with us. Betty in Unity, you're on with the Premier. Yes, Mr. Wall, hello. Um, I want to know how what you are going to do to improve the quality of life for our seniors in the long-term care facilities when abuse has been reported and why there is no follow-up done and dealt with in a timely manner. Well, I, I, I'm not sure uh, about the specific case you're talking uh, about, but we have... Uh, Obviously, we've taken the system takes uh, very seriously uh, any sort of elder abuse, whether it's happening in a in a uh, quote unquote government facility or a facility that isn't government but supported uh, with tax dollars. Uh, when we came to government in '07, there hadn't really been a long-term care uh, bed opened uh, or replaced in years and years and years. And so, this is a question of operations. I think that Betty's asking, but. You know, it starts with the appropriate capital facility, the appropriate uh, number of beds. And, of course, we've announced 13 new long-term care beds that are in different phases of construction. I think one just opened here of those 13. We're talking about a new facility in Amicus where we partnered with the Catholic Health Ministry to deliver, we think, improved long-term care where, where seniors who may be at different levels of care requirements can still age in place together in one unit. Uh, and we, uh, we've had an announcement of a pending facility even here in Swift Current, where I'm, where I'm from, where there's been a great need. So it's capital facilities, but if there's concerns at all around elder abuse, you know, we would take those very seriously uh, and would encourage them to be, to, for the MLAs to be uh, notified in this regard, and certainly potentially the other authorities as well that would be involved. Okay, uh, Mr. Reed, uh, you said 13 new long-term care beds. I assume... Sorry, you know, facilities, right. Facilities. So how, what are we doing right. at for, for total bed count? Yeah, there? new facilities, sorry. Okay, so what, what would the rough total bed count be with, with 13 new facilities? I don't have it off the top, mate. It would, be, it would really vary because some of them would be in smaller centers and uh, they might be 15, 20 beds and others would be significantly larger. In the case of Swift Current, for example, we're talking 200 plus because it's replacing three existing facilities attached to the hospital. So it'll really vary, but a very significant increase with, you know, again, here more needed as well as a focus on home care because increasingly that's, I think understood by families and by patients and by, by the health system that uh, obviously the longer that people can be in their home independently uh, and with a quality of life, the better it is for them uh, and the more effective it is for the health system. All right, real fast. Elaine, Prince Albert, last question. Yes, good morning, Premier Wall. I have called in before about this issue. You need to ask the question, Elaine. They're okay, um, I'm just wondering, I'm 60. Is there any chance there's going to be a second bridge in Prince Albert before I turn 100? <laughs> There's a very good chance there will be before you turn 100, and uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be any more specific than that. I think we've answered the question. It's not in the current capital project. Um, you know, there's even still some debate uh, locally about where it would go uh, and what what share might be down the road, provincial or federal or local. But we know the importance of it. We know the importance of actually additional bridges in the city of Saskatoon, and there's other large capital projects around the province as well, and we're. Uh, we're aware of them, and um, I think it's a safe bet to say that uh, when Elaine turns 100, she'll be celebrating at or near a uh, new facility in Prince Albert. Mr. Premier, uh, always good having you by. We'll uh, see you soon. 
John, thanks for your time. Have a great day. Premier Brad Wall, we call it Ask the Premier. I'm John Gormley. Here, we call it News Talk Radio.